working with here. Um, and I thought as Mark was able to call in and join this session, uh, it would just be a wonderful opportunity to have his input and insights as well in our conversation, if that's okay. Of course, Elaine Jill, it's great to see you again. Mark, it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, likewise. Okay, activating the hearts of light, Jude. What's your thoughts on this? <laughs> I'll throw you in at the beyond me, It's beyond me, Gov. I think um, <laughs> the conversation that Jill and Elaine and I had the other day was around something about showing up and getting out of the way. And that 25 years ago, um, when Elaine had a, a sense of walking through the doors of Gorton Monastery and having no idea what would be now 25 years later, um, I feel very much in that journey too, because for all of my life, I've been on a journey of exploration and discovery um, and it's ongoing for all of us. But it seems to me that we're in an amazing time where we have ourselves come so far, but we literally stand on the shoulders of giants that go back millennia. You know, we go back to the early Gnostic teachings and before that, we go through all of the, of the deep mystical traditions of all traditions and, and, and all of that. We go through St. Francis and St. Clair and their wondrous teachings. And we go on through the Franciscan um, community and we come to now. So when we talk about activating the hearts of light, I feel this activation has been going on for thousands of years. And sometimes it's been in the open and other times it's been deep, deep hidden for very sensible reasons. And I love the synchronicity of Elaine reading what you wrote, Jill, back in 2012. Mm. Because for a lot of folks, 2012, at the end of the Mayan long count, was deemed to be a potential shift of consciousness. And, and some folks thought it would be like switching on the light. And I don't know about you, but I never felt that way. What I did feel was that it was a turning, a pivot, perhaps, point but it would take however long it took with no guarantee of what the other end of it was. But I felt we were entering into the potential of a birthing process. A birthing process that in my sense is still moving its way through. So for me, activating the hearts of light is about attuning to and aligning with that evolutionary impulse that is in my sense far bigger than not just each of us or all of us as humanity. For me, as a cosmologist and a multidimensional seeker and explorer, this is an evolutionary impulse that's been embodied in our universe from the very beginning. And it's been this incredible journey and we're on the bow wave of its potential. So we are the first, as far as I know, of Gaia's children to be able to not by not just biologically evolve, but to consciously evolve. Yeah. yeah. So for me, activating the hearts of light is activating the light within us that is our true nature, that is who we really are, so that we can bring the sacred masculine, the sacred feminine together to give birth to the sacred child within us, because for me, that is the, the deep symbolism and the deep teachings of all traditions. This, 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 the, you know, the one becomes two, the two becomes three. And it's that resolution and that literary resolution that I feel is, is what the deepest opportunity and message of activating the hearts of light is about. Yeah. I, I feel as well that we've been dispaired. We were in dispair. And now we're in repair. I love it. I mean, I talk, I, I agree. I, I talk about being dismembered. We dismembered our psyche. Now we are remembering <laughs> who we really are. Do you think there has been an acceleration of this process recently? I do. I do. And I feel that, um, I mean, I really started to notice that acceleration at the beginning of last year 
because as well as a cosmologist, I'm an astrologer, and there was a major conjunction on the 12th of January last year, 20, was it 2020? I think it was. 2020, it's been an odd time. Um, and what that offered us, I think astrologically, was a major pivot point into this acceleration. And I was asked to write about its influences. And it was all about that which no longer serves as will fall away. Uh, and I wrote that in early January. And I was asked to write about, well, what did I think that meant? And I said, I can't, because what I can sense is a black swan event coming. And a black swan event is something that nobody has any sense of or idea of until it's happened and everybody looks back and go, oh, of course. And on January the 12th, or a couple of days afterwards, was when I first became aware that potentially something was coming and it turned to be COVID-19. And a pandemic, which we were talking about it earlier, for me, is less a crisis than the potential for metamorphosis. I agree totally, yeah. Um, so um, the, the birthing or the rebirthing of the monastery fits into that completely. And that, you know, we've been struggling all of this time. We knew what our, uh, we knew what we were meant to be doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, and we felt like we were continually birthing, you know, we were continually uh, in gestation and, and, and trying to birth. Uh, and, and then in the midst of what seemed like despair, <laughs> we were able to repair um, and, and, and evolve into something completely new, which is the, um, the the co-joining of the divine masculine and the divine feminine yeah and for you it's been a metamorphosis yeah because you went into this as a sort of a, a beautiful caterpillar <laughs> where you're coming out yeah. an even more beautiful butterfly it will be one of those big blue ones you know that you get <laughs> stunning absolutely absolutely <laughs> Uh, and Mark's been on this journey as well as the divine masculine, because very much today we've had all the divine feminine in today. Um, and so Mark has been here um, actually working on the grids and on the energy lines, which has helped us get to this point today. So I don't know if you'd like to say anything, Mark, about that. Yeah, there's, there's so many connections coming together. Guys, can I just say it's a little difficult to hear you, so you may need to come a bit closer. I don't know if anybody else is having a bit of a... Yeah, is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. There's my voice slightly to echo, but that's fine. Um, in this beautiful space, so the, the connections that are emerging that I, that I'm sensing are uh, you spoke about many of them there about what's happening without is also happening within. So the, the wisdom that this beautiful space holds, both energetic and uh, built into the very stone of the building, is actually helping us find that within ourselves. Yes. So. The, the balance of the male and the female energies in this place are a template, if you like. And that links back to the template, the, the templates of energy. And these templates of energy are showing us how to find our balance and find our inner workings. So it's, it's, it's very much like Schatz Cathedral. It's like a, an alchemical process showing us the way. And um, that's certainly been my experience here. The more I've, I've been involved in the place here, the more I've grown inside and more connections that have come about and um, in a very real sense uh, it totally shatters the five century box um, many people live in the five century box um, but places special places like this and many others i'm sure you've experienced around the world just give you that experience of going beyond into uh, the totality of all that is to the extent you're ready for going into that and experiencing, like, what well, some call it, the veil, but experiencing um, the truth of who we really are. And yeah. I think that's, that's the greatest gift, is experiencing the, the truth of who we really are. And these places are catalysts for this. Uh, they absolutely and utterly are. And I'm so thrilled and pleased to be involved in, in this project. And it's, it's certainly been a catalyst on my journey and many others. So yeah, I love the exciting bits. I love how spirit and, and quantum physics come together. Um, <laughs> And we could very well be talking about the same thing from two different perspectives and probably are. Um, so yeah, all, all that kind of stuff comes together in, in, in a place like this and the effects are tangible. 
um, those who are willing just to silence the stuff a tiny bit. I think I think it is, and I love I love all that you're doing there. What's What's important for me though is is a, a quote from Wendell Berry, and he said there are no unsacred places; there are only <laughs> sacred places and desecrated places. So you know there you have this amazing. Um, it is a sacred place, but it's a sacred place where everywhere is sacred, but because so much love and commitment and service have been embodied within it, that there is that tangibility of, of that sanctity. And it seems to me that one of our opportunities and invitations as we remember who we really are is to restore it to restore so that we we open if you like Einstein called it a circle of compassion so that that love touches everybody and everywhere and literally heals our relationship with Gaia we're, we're Mother's Day today you know Gaia our planetary home is our primary mother and so part of this for me is vitally healing our relationship with her and all her children and I love what you're doing on the on the energy lines because I wrote a book called the Cosmic Hologram, um, information. In other words, meaningful information at the centre of creation. So everything the, that is the appearance of our world emerges from deeper realms of causation, and it's all as you know, Mark, and I'm sure Jill and Elaine do that. Everything is patterned in in what's called fractals. So we are literally interrelated through resonant patterns and harmonics that are consciousness, yeah? So mind and consciousness aren't something we have, it's literally what we and the whole world are. So, so the, 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 the building and the people and the land and, 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 and are all part of this inherent consciousness dynamic interplay. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we have time, it'd be lovely to talk about what is awakening in the sense of both the land and also if you like the the overlighting archetypal consciousness that i feel is very much part of this this is this is a multi-dimensional effort <laughs> big time yeah yeah um and in case, well, you get, uh, with the francis you get that connection again to gaia because obviously francis was well, now he's been named, you know, the patron saint of ecology. I'm not sure if he's happy with that one or not, but um, but certainly for him, it was just natural. Gaia, Gaia, there was no Gaia. It was just mother. He called it mother. It was just part of him. The the earth and him were one. So, uh, yeah. and and this building reflects that in a way because when they built these buildings, the columns were meant to be the trees. So, so it's these huge columns, which are meant to be these huge trees, like oak trees or whatever you want them to be, reaching up into the heavens. And then all around this place, we have flowers, amazing carvings of flowers. We have dragonflies. Um, so again, it's like a garden. You're in a, in a structural garden. And then in the middle of the monastery, we have a cloister garden which was always important in, in monasteries anyway, but they were used for reflection generally, a, mon a cloister garden. Um, well, here, what we're doing is we're planting it as a, for culinary herbs, medicinal herbs, um, very much a, what a traditional monastery within all of their gardens would have. So for example, just to revive us all today, we've been sitting here and I've been putting um, <laughs> Fennel under people's noses and lemon balm. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. People. So again, it's <laughs> it's Mother Nature it is is here in the earth as well. Um, and we also have a rose, which is a specific oh, rose for this beautiful. monastery, which is called Rose Rosa Hugoensis, which was one of our um, friars was a plant hunter, and he found this out in China. Wow. So we have copies of, we have, you know, examples of that here. So, yeah, and, 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 and when somebody walks into that building, they walk, they're not only are they a fractal, you know, they're, they're yes. experiencing all of these fractals here, which are just exactly. perfection. 
Absolutely. And, and when I speak of Gaia, Jill, it, Gaia is a sentient being, as a living being, multidimensional living being. So not just, not a background. No. Literally a co-evolutionary partner. Another aspect, another expression, as, as Francis would say, of God, because everything yeah. is, is God. Uh, a friend of mine says we're, we need to start saying we're not human beings, we're Gaians. <laughs> which i wholeheartedly agree with because that then says there's a belonging there's a deep belonging of all of us and all her children and all that she is yeah. and and as mark knows you know her she is activating now she is you know there's there's a co-evolutionary impulse working through all of us and all of her at the moment I was reading um, Hamish Miller's gift, Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst, about the Apollo and Athena line. Yes. And, um, and of course, that goes through Athena. And, it does. And I was, uh, Spirit reminded me to read it again. And they were saying, which I had, had forgotten, was the, the male line and the female line, they come together. And, and in Hamish's and Paul's experience, it was, it was the only place in Athena where the two lines come together and actually merge. Because normally they come together in a node point, but not in a CC. They run together. Like the male and the female are together in union, running yeah. through the center of a CC. And I just thought, wow, that is just so wonderful. And you and then, it is, and it is wonderful. It, it absolutely. Us, obviously, for Hamish today. Yes. Um, this is Hamish's stat um, statue of the, the serpent power and and the sword of truth and the vesica pisces so to remind us of hamish as well well thank you for bringing hamish into into our circle hamish was a dear friend of mine and his uh, wife bar is is a dear friend um and he and paul did some amazing work i mean one of the things we might like to to, to continue in terms of activate activating the hearts of light is really what's coming through now because back in 2003 um, I was um, guiding the 12th of 13 journeys um, to activate Gaia's um, activate Gaia's planetary grid for this time back in 2003 and Hamish and I were together on on that and what we were finding the the, the 12th journey was actually a pilgrimage along what's called the Michael Mary line, which of course Hamish and Paul and Barr and others were absolutely, um, you know, at the heart of. Um, and what we were finding as we did the pilgrimage from St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall through to Avebury, and of course the, the energy lines go through to the North Sea, was that the masculine Michael and the feminine Mary, as you say, Jill, they do have node points in various places like uh, St. Michael's Mount, like Glastonbury, like Avery, um, they don't merge, but they do come together. But what we were finding, and for the first time, is there seemed to be a third aspect. And the third aspect was acting like an energetic two-year-old child, running between the Michael Mary line and was coming back only at the node points. But between those node points, was sort of moving in a much more active way and Hamish had also picked up on this but I think we just kept quiet about it because we weren't sure what it meant um, and then last September around St Michael's Day uh, we were doing some healing work up in Yorkshire close to another major pairing of energy lines called the Ellen Bellina line that runs from the Isle of Wight all the way up to the north of Scotland. And we started to notice the beginnings of an activation of a child essence with the Ellen Bellinus line. So what we've been picking up over the last few months is that if we look at the British Isles as a fractal of Gaia, as a as much larger, there seems to be an awakening and I think this is part of the awakening of the hearts of light. So geomantically within Britain, we have the Michael Mary line, and then we have the Ellen Bellinus line. 
And they literally, when you talked about Hamish's Vesica Pisces and the sword, it's almost like they form an Excalibur. Yes. A yes. sacred sword over the land. And the Michael Mary is a spiritual axis. And the Ellen Bellinus is the leadership axis. And what we're finding now, and I say we, there are circles, healing circles on healing circles who are tuning into this, is that the child aspect of the Michael Mary is a masculine spirituality. And the child aspect of the Ellen Bellinus is a feminine leadership. Fantastic. So there's this integration within us and within all of us and within the land. And we're calling it the awakening of Albiona because Iona was seen, and if Marilyn's still on the course, she will be aware that the founders of Findhorn did pilgrimage to Iona and saw that as a, as a portal of this, yes. this Christed energy, this unity awareness many years ago. And it feels as though there is now this integration and this embodiment. And that is why Gorton Monastery is a heart of light and so many other hearts of light. And what mm -hmm. Sue and Mom are doing are all hearts of light now, activating and awakening mm -hmm. to serve, you know, the, the greatest good of, of all beings through this incredible evolutionary moment. That brings to us when you fly over the plane and you fly at night, and you look down onto a land and you can see all the little cities all lit up. That's what came to mind then when you said that. It was just like, you know, a ping as the lights go on in Manchester, ping in the heart, yes. you know, as, you, as you're, you're flying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But these lights are 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> They're lights that are in each person's heart. And I talk about them being in the universal heart of the eighth chakra. Because you, this, you this transcends, yeah, yeah, this transcends this persona. As Mark was talking about earlier, this is, this is us wakening up to our div being divine beings, having, you know, human experiences. And so it's, it's actually bringing us into the universal heart where we're all those tiny parts within the great light. And we were talking the other day about the eighth chakra being linked to the symbol of the mom as well. Very much so. Yeah. And this of course was before Sue and I met, we spoke. So, you know, whatever the synchronicities as I know we all love and we, 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 we follow them like breadcrumbs <laughs> <laughs> on our journey, on our adventure. But this is where the synchronicities speak to us and, and, and help us in, in, you know, that intuitive wisdom that really guides us into the hearts of light that we truly are. Have you got any sense of how Albiona is going to go forward? <laughs> Intra well, yes and no. There is a sense of the envisaging of that. And in fact, there have been for many, many, many hundreds of years, this sense somehow that Britain has a role to play, is a soul model rather than a role model, is a soul model potentially for this time. And that relates to the, the esoteric traditions, the esoteric Christian traditions, the Knights Templar, traditions, um, so many more, the, the Arthurian mythos of a light, a light, a beacon, but to be that light, it seems to me we have to, as Mark says, um, do the inner work so that we can, we, can, we can literally rise ourselves into being that wholeness that we really are and live it. You know, it's not just understanding it, it's, it's living it, it's embodying it. And I think, so uh, that's my sense, but I also feel, and this has been a vital part of our work, is the healing and the releasing of trauma. We talked trauma uh, a, a while ago. And, you know, we've collectively, we've bought into the illusion of separation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, we, if our worldview is a worldview 
of separation, we act in that way. And if our worldview is healed to perceive the oneness and the unity of which we all are, then we act in a very different way. And so it seems to me that, you know, the buying into the, the illusion of separation, because the science is showing us, just as the wisdom traditions have always shown us, that it is an illusion, we behave dysfunctionally. So there's a lot of trauma that's arisen through that. So it seems to me that as, as healers and serving this awakening um, is about healing and releasing those traumas with, with forgiveness and not blaming, but just realizing we've come to this place, but we're holding luggage that we don't need to hold on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Elaine and would echo that, that, in the, that both Elaine and Mark would echo that in the journey of the monastery. You know, it's been about releasing and coming through trauma to this point now. Yeah. Yeah. Would you the building agree? as well? Yeah. yeah. Everything. Everything. And one of the things we haven't talked about is that, you know, the very early understandings of the monastery were led by two amazing geomancers, Melanie Thomas and David Ellis, who run Earthwise, um, and their whole life's purpose. Um, interestingly, Melanie used to work on a local level and Dave used to work on the bigger level. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really interesting, the, the male, female, but they, they were so instrumental in teaching us the power of, of what we had here and also then looking back through their um, connections and all the different traditions and yeah. we talk about the Arthur sword and the map that we've got that Dave yeah. created that literally linked all of these points and showed that the monastery was also linked to our below and tied into the Bellinus line and you've done a lot of work at Alderley Edge haven't you we then did the work at Cheetons with the well yeah. Um, where the, the male and female line cross in Manchester. So over the period of all of our kind of individual and collective journeys, we've all been doing the same thing, but in different ways. So that now it's... A absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think it was your guidance, Jill, that you read out earlier about we can't do this on our own. We can only do this all together. And a lot of the, the work that I'm involved with, um, with Whole World View and with many of our partners globally, is, is, is this unity, unity and diversity and living that and how do we live that. But I'm really feeling to go beyond this idea of unity and diversity, to go e beyond that to unity in inclusion and to go even beyond that to unity in belonging. Because when we belong, we don't need an invitation to show up. We just know. Yeah. And I loved, I think it was Sue read out a John O'Donoghue, some John O'Donoghue words. And John wrote about the longing to belong. And it seems to me that as we activate the hearts of light, we're activating that deep knowing within us that we belong. And then we can come together and link up and lift up and level up and light up. And then what? You ask me, what is the vision? I don't know, but I know that when we do that, it will be magnificent. It will be beyond anything that we have any imagination to even find words for. It seems to be Phoenix coming out. It is Phoenix coming out of us. Um, out of this past year, 18 months of people being in lockdown, that, that they have actually started to realise that the other side of that is this deep sense of belonging, wanting to belong. Um, and, I, and I think that's been, not for everybody, but there have been certainly for some people, it is like their hearts have lit up. They've started to question um, who am I? What am I? How do I belong? Um, what is this feeling in me that, that you know that that makes me want to do more than I am, and 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 understand the world more and things like that? So um, I, th I think this has been an amazing journey, a very traumatic journey for some, but also an amazing journey for others. 
I agree. And I certainly, like you, Jill, don't want to, to, to sort of say it hasn't been unbelievably challenging and, and oh, painful for so, so many people. And that's what I mean, really, by when we link up and lift up, we can virtually and physically put our arms around each other. We can virtually and physically hug each other. We can see each other and feel each other heart to heart. Because when we do activate the hearts of light, then, you know, everybody belongs and everyone is welcome and no one is left behind. And we come back to France again, in a way. <laughs> yes. We always come back to France. We always come back to Francis and Claire, quite <laughs> rightly. <laughs> quite rightly. It was that the two of them were just so inclusive. <laughs> Without but also, he was inclusive. They were inclusive of, of everything, everything in existence. It wasn't just humanity. No. It was everything in existence. Brother, son, sister, moon. Sister, moon, absolutely. Death, death life, yeah. Brother, death. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that I've learned from being with many, many indigenous uh, communities around the world is the importance of honouring rites of passage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that in our secular societies and the way we've been, we've not honoured to the extent that I feel we can. And I would invite that as part of our going forward together, we, we re-enter into those those ebbs and flows of, of life and death and passaging, because that's mm -hmm. such an important part. And I think actually a lot of our trauma, apart from the illusion of separation, a lot of trauma is when we subdue our emotions around rites of passage. Mm -hmm. Because when we honor them, they become a natural part of life and death and rebirth and just mm -hmm. the way the world is. So that's a really important aspect of both healing our trauma, but also in moving forward to, to honor those. Well, saying we good, I think now it's our time to be moving forward. I can see uh, Sue is moving towards us here as if she's going to come. <laughs> she's a woman on a mission. <laughs> she's a woman on a mission. And um, uh, I think... We were talking before about um, the eighth chakra and giving out from our universal eighth chakra. So thank you, Jude. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Lovely to meet you, Jude. Thank you. And lovely to meet you, Mark. And thanks again, Sue. Thank you. And, and Jude, I wonder if you may offer the heart of... I'd, I'd love to. Please, for us all. Thank you, Sue. One of the things that's been coming through, everyone, as part of this awakening of Albiona and what might be coming forward and the activating of the hearts of light. Heart of Light was an impulse that actually came forward through a number of healers 40, 50 years ago. And now it's just expanding so that it's everyone, but we're hearts within the universal heart. And we've not been able to shake hands and we've not been able to hug each other for quite a while. And I was saying to, 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 to Jill and, and to Elaine and <laughs> to Sue the other day, I can't elbow bump because I'm smaller than most people. So I either have to jump up or I miss them or something goes wrong. But this came forward that to put our left hand and our right hand on top of the universal heart of the eighth chakra and to just invite us to light up our hearts with kindness. So as we say those words, to go from the universal heart within us, invite us to light up our hearts and then express the embrace of the whole world with kindness and then just bring back to So, light up our hearts with kindness. 
and instead of shaking hands when we can, I'm going to take this as the way that I greet people and I invite all of us to do that if that feels something we'd like to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jude, most sincerely. Um, Susie, I wonder if I could just get you to spotlight us. Oh, thank you. And, and Jude, um, the words and the actions that you have shared with us, the knowledge, the wisdom of your life's work is so deeply appreciated and, and helps us to see the connection between Mother Earth, Gaia, our own human nervous system being in alignment and the cosmology, um, the sky, the planets above. And um, what we're going to do now, so thank you so much, we're going to um, spotlight, hopefully sacred fire, 